Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm Jarrell, and I want to welcome you to the uh, Tuesday evening Bible study. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of it. Thank you that you're here with us. Uh, if you're tuning in right now, uh, just go ahead and uh, you know, let me know that you're here, state your name uh, and where you're watching from. And uh, I'd really appreciate that. So thank you so much for uh, for being a part of the service. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's going to be pretty cool. We're going to have an interactive time of Bible study. And what we're going to do is about 30 minutes of teaching or so from about eight o'clock, eight oh five to about eight thirty five. And then we'll do about 10 or 15 minutes of questions and answers. If you have any, uh, let us, you know, of course, let us know. And um, and we'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have or just any comments that you may want to make. So uh, we want to make ourselves available to you and be a blessing to you any way that we can. So, again, thank you for taking time this Tuesday evening. You know, I chose Tuesday because, uh, you know, Monday, of course, is Monday night football and uh, pretty good game last night. A lot better than I thought it was going to be. Uh, Thursday is Thursday night football. And I know Wednesday is a common uh, Bible study night for churchgoers. So uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for taking time this Tuesday. Thanks for letting me into your home. And this is something that we want to do on a consistent basis, not uh, not just one time, but we want to do this every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, in your living room, in your bedroom, at your kitchen table, with your kids. Uh, it doesn't matter. So thank you again, and uh, we really appreciate it. Let's pray, and we'll get right into today's Bible lesson. Father, we thank you for an opportunity today, sir, to meditate upon the Word, to study the Scripture, and to just learn about Jesus and to learn about the love that you have for us in Christ and to really just grow and develop uh, into the fullness of all that you've created us to be. So I ask you, Father, to give to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. Teach us all about Jesus tonight. And I thank you for your anointing that's present upon this service, upon this meeting, <clears throat> upon this live stream. And I thank you that the ears of everybody present uh, everybody listening and everybody who will listen, I thank you. Their ears are anointed to, to hear, their eyes are anointed to see, and their hearts are anointed to receive. We love you with all of our heart, and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> we've been talking uh, in our church service, uh, we've been talking about Abraham, and we've been studying his life. And I want you, if you have your Bible, I want you to look at Isaiah 51 and I want to show you why we are looking at Abraham. I kind of want to bring you into uh, our church service and what goes on on Sunday mornings at Liberty Church. And I really believe that if you can hear what's being said by the Lord here tonight, that it's really going to help you. Uh, he says in verse one, Isaiah 51, verse one, he says, hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness and you that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence you are hewn and to the hole of the pit whence you were digged. Now look at the instructions of God here. Look to Abraham, your father, and look unto Sarah that bare you, or your mother. For I called him alone, and I blessed him, and I increased him. Now here's a very important verse. Look at verse 3. For the Lord will comfort Zion. Now, according to Hebrews 12, 22, Zion is the church, uh, those who are in Christ. In the Old Testament, it's a type of the church, those believers who would put faith in Jesus and be made righteous uh, by faith, not by their performance. So notice what God is telling the church. This is, this is interesting, and I'm praying that you catch this. He tells the church, or Zion, look to Abraham. Look to Abraham. And if you can look and see how I bless this man, how I increase this man, if you can uh, study this man's life and see how I operated in his life and the grounds for which I was able to bless him. Let me give you some uh, some information really quick in case you're not familiar with Abraham. But Abraham was not a perfect man. He had a lot of mistakes, a lot of flaws. And he did a lot of things that if we were to do or if you were to see somebody do, you would think, man, uh, God couldn't have any relationship with that guy. 
But here's the key that I want you to understand. And here's what God is saying. Here's the first thing I want you to get that Abraham was right with God. He was righteous, not by his performance, not because he was such a good guy. He was right with God because of faith. He put faith in God. He believed God. And because of that, on those grounds, on the grounds of faith, a relationship with God by faith, God was able to bless him and God was able to increase him. And it says here he called him alone. In other words, God was the only source of this man's success. And I believe that that's what God is trying to get you to see tonight. So he, t- he speaks to the church in verse three and he says, the Lord will comfort Zion. The Lord will comfort Zion. Now, you got to be able to understand what God is saying here. God is not uh, saying, you know, yeah, you know, I'm going to pat you on your back when you're feeling bad. Now, I believe it includes that. But comfort is more than that. Actually, the comforter is the Holy Ghost. John 14, 26 and John 15, 26, Jesus speaking to his disciples. And both of those verses refers to the Holy Spirit as the comforter. Now, listen to me close here. Here's what God is saying. If you will look at Abraham, if you will study this man's life, if you will look to him and see that uh, in spite of him, irregardless, or we could say independent of his performance, he had flaws, he had sins, he had things in his life just like you and I have in our lives but God was still able to flow in his life in a mighty way. And what God is telling the church is, if you want to see my power or the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the life of God, the strength of God, the spirit of God, if you want to see my power operate in your life, if you want to see me work miraculously in your life, Uh, You know, when Paul wrote to the church of Galatia in Galatians chapter three, verse, I believe it's around verse four. He said, tell me, uh, you who want to deal with God based on your performance, if you want God to bless you because of something you're deserving or worthy of. He says, let me ask you this question. Has God been blessing you this whole time because you're worthy of it? He said, no, but God has been moving in your life powerfully by his spirit. He's been working miraculously in your life. He's been doing things, healing you, delivering you, opening doors up for you, prospering you, giving you favor, things that you're not even qualified for. God is making those things happen in your life. And I'm telling you that it's not on the grounds of of our performance. And so what God is saying here is Zion or the church, if you want to experience my power in your life, If you want to see me work miraculously in your life, you know, I have a friend of mine and, uh, you know, this guy, he, he's a prosperous guy. He's really blessed. And, uh, and God, God works powerfully in his life. I mean, it's, it's evident that God works in his life and actually a couple of my, my, my buddies, but they, you know, God just, for one of my friends, God just recently opened the door for him to an amazing career field. I mean, this guy, he's working for major league soccer. He does, he, he's a, he's a black guy. Doesn't know anything about soccer, never played soccer. He's a, he's an NBA guy. And, and they said, we want you. And they, they paid him way more than what he's worth, way more than what he was making at his previous job. And he's not even in a sense. Now, I'm not knocking him, but in a sense, he's not, according necessarily based on the field he's going into, qualified. But see, God is flowing in his life, not because of his performance, not because of his perfection, but because he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are many of my friends. Many people in our church are seeing things happen, miracles, healing, prosperity not because of our performance. And what I want to do tonight is I want to take your attention off of you. You know, one of the ways that Satan works and one of the ways that he gains traction in our life 
is he gets you to be uh, self-centered. He gets you to try to be focused on yourself. He gets you to try to make yourself or try to impress God or be worthy to deserve from God. And you know that you don't necessarily read your Bible as much as you should. You know your church attendance may not be exactly what it should. You know that you have doubts and you have fears and you have imperfections. And if you're not careful, Satan will use those things to try to make you feel as though God won't flow or that God can't flow in your life because of your imperfections. And my brother, my sister, I'm telling you, that's just not the case. That's not true. Abraham had fears. Uh, You remember he lied about his wife saying that she was his sister because she was afraid, because he was afraid. And God, what did God do? He just simply sent Sarah in there on a lie. Abraham lied. He sent Sarah into Pharaoh's house. Next thing you know, the very next verse says, Pharaoh turns over all of his wealth and riches into this man's life. The next verse says Abraham was very rich in silver, cattle and gold and servants and maid servants or women servants. That's Genesis 13 too. And how did it happen? Did it happen because he was living? Now, I don't want anybody to be offended or think that I'm condoning sin or lying. I'm not condoning sin or lying. But what I'm saying is God is not moving in your life relative to your performance. God, even with fears, even with imperfections, even when you're doubting, God is faithful. And if you can open your heart wide and just believe that God is pleased with you because you put faith in Jesus, If you can believe that God loves you because you put faith in Jesus, if you can believe as Ephesians one and four says that you are without blame, faultless in the eyes of God, that he loves you beyond measure. He loves you as much as he loves Jesus. That's what Jesus prayed in John 17. If you can believe that it'll free you from everything that you are looking at as a hindrance Uh, in your life or a reason that God can't bless you. And so what God is telling the church here through Isaiah and Isaiah 51, he says, guys, listen, pay attention to what I did with Abraham. If let me put it in the Jarrell translation. If you think that I'm blessing you because you deserve it, (laughs) you got me wrong. God is saying, Hey, I want to be gracious to you. You know what grace is? It's undeserved favor. It's unearned favor. You know, there's a sister in in our church and I love her with all of my heart. And she called me the other day and she told me, she said, and she grew up in church her whole life. And she, she said, you know, my life is changing. It's changing. I have seen the change and the power of God and the life of God. She said, I went from knowing that God could do something and that God could do all things to really believing. I know, like I know, it is absolutely sure that God is moving powerfully, positioning me, blessing me, and doing things in my life. Now, what freed her? What freed her? Because we preach the gospel. See, the gospel is not the power of you. It's not your ability to impress God. (laughs) I know some of you may be having a hard hard time with this, but listen to me. If I can get you to understand that God is dealing with you independent of your performance, that's what will free you and open your heart to not feel condemned, to not feel like you have to do everything right, cross all of your T's and dot all of your I's because you're not able to. But if you can just freely take your place as a child, Jesus said, unless you come to the father like a child, You won't you you can't receive. God can't move in your life. God is a father and he wants to be your father. You know, I have a daughter, a small child, and we have another one on the way. And she has uh, she's a baby and she makes mistakes. She's two years old. She doesn't act perfect in her performance, but she's my my daughter. She's my baby. And I want you to know that you are loved by the father. God is rejoicing over you. He loves you with all of his heart and he is not asking you to try to impress him and be this, you know, this awesome thing that religion has preached. He's asking you to let me 
bless you and favor you and let me live through you. Let me give you the desires of your heart. Let me give you a desire to serve me. Let me move in you to want to uh, study. Let me move in you to want to love me. And God is not asking you to do these things independent of him. Let's keep moving along here. I don't want to get stuck on that. So he tells, he tells the church here, he says, I want you to focus on how I blessed Abraham. And he says, if you do, I'll be able to comfort you. I'll be able to work powerfully in your life. I'll be able to allow or flow. My spirit will be able to flow. He's the comforter. My spirit will be able to move powerfully and miraculously in your life. Now, what happens once the Holy Spirit is moving in our lives? What happens when we're receiving God's blessings by grace and not because of our great performance and we're not trying to impress God and we're not trying to pray, you know, four hours to make God, you know, give us one answer prayer, you know, and we're not, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, you know, fast for nine days in order for God to, you know, open a door at the job so you can get a promote. What happens when you just simply depend on his unmerited favor, his grace, the way he blessed Abraham. What happens? Look at what he says here. Verse three, he will make your wilderness like Eden. He will make your wilderness like Eden. You know, God's will for man has always been the garden of Eden. It's always been God. The Bible says in the book of Romans that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He never changes his mind. When God put Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden, he, he, never, he never got that off of his mind. Man sinned, yes, but God's plan has always been for men to be blessed and for men to enjoy the blessings of God. And so he put this man in the Garden of Eden. And when Adam sinned, yes, he lost it. But God, through Jesus, has got the Garden of Eden back for us. We are now able to live in a place where all things have been freely given to us, we have life, we have abundance, we have peace. You know, the word uh, Eden, I talked to our church about this a few weeks ago, but the word Eden, if you were to study this word in the Hebrew, it literally means luxury or opulence. Luxury or opulence. Now, I want you to think about luxury. You know, you can have a Honda. That's what I drive. That'll get me from point A to point B. It's a car, but you could have a Rolls Royce. It does the exact same thing. They don't do anything different, but one, the, the Rolls Royce is more than what you need. It's abundance. It's extravagant. It's opulent. It's a luxury car. I have news for you, child of God. God wants you to enjoy more than what you need. Get used to it because it's your inheritance. God wants you to have the abundant life that Jesus, not Jarrell, Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. When Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus in the third chapter, Ephesians 3, he said, no man can really search the height and the depth of the riches that are in Christ. God has blessed you beyond measure. And if you can believe that you're a child of God and you're right with God because of faith in Jesus, if you can just simply take your place in Jesus and realize that the Lord is your righteousness, that's what you said when you got saved. You believed in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you called out and confessed and acknowledged that Jesus was the Lord or your Lord. What does that mean? That he's your righteousness. The book of Isaiah says that in the Lord, we will say, I have righteousness and strength. That's what it means when you said, Jesus, you're my Lord. In other words, you're coming to God in Christ, not in yourself. You're receiving from God based on what Jesus deserves and not what you deserve. You're dead. This is the great truth of the gospel. Paul wrote to the church and he said, I'm crucified with Christ, or I put faith in the cross of Jesus. I'm dead. But then he said this, really, I'm alive, but it's not me. 
Christ is now my life. So how do I live? By faith of the Son of God. That's how God wants you to live. Jesus did not come for himself. He came for you. And if you will simply take your place and just acknowledge the Lord is my strength. He's my righteousness. That's the grounds for God to flow in your life and move powerfully. And so another description he gives here, he says, I will turn your desert into the Garden of Eden. And then he says this. Gladness and joy. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody will be heard in your midst. God wants you to live every day thankful. Now, listen to me. I know in church we've heard, you know, uh, you know, give thanks to the Lord. And we should. That's true. But God is not saying here just by faith, give thanks. God is saying you're going to live thankful. You're going to be giving me thanks. You're going to be singing. You're going to be full of joy. Why? Because you're actually going to start receiving everything that my word says is yours. You're going to actually begin to enjoy everything that my word says is yours. You know, I brought up my little daughter and every time somebody gives her something or we give her something, we train her. And you guys that have kids too know what I'm saying. You train them to say what? Thank you. Thank you. I don't make her walk around the house and say, you know, thank you, daddy. Thank you, daddy, when I'm not doing anything. You know, sometimes in the church, this is what we do, you know. You know, well, you know, thank you. Thank you. And yet there's a place for faith where you need to believe things beyond what you can see. That's true. But God doesn't want his blessings to stay in the unseen realm. God wants you to be in a place where you are thanking God because you're really enjoying manifestation. Not just anymore calling things that be not as though they were, but the things that you called that were not actually came into existence. And what he's saying here is you're going to be living in a, in a life in an attitude of thanksgiving. You are going to enjoy manifestation. You are going to start receiving my blessings and my goodness and my love in your life. And it's going to cause you to sing and rejoice and be full of melody. Uh, if you understand that, just right in your house, just say, by faith, thank you, Lord. I, I'm going to start receiving because the blessings of God are mine, even though my actions are not perfect. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Now, let's go look at Abraham real quick. And I want to, with the last, we have about 10 minutes here. And with the last few minutes that we have, I want to show you something that I think will really help you this week. And God is introducing Abraham to the world in Genesis 11. And he's beginning to kind of give us some light on who this man is and, and, uh, and what he's about. And I want to call your attention to the first description that God gives about Abraham. This is very important. So stick with me here. Now look at what he says. Genesis 11 and verse 28. Well, let's start in 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So he had three, three boys, three sons. Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity, Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. Now look at the first description that we see about Abraham and, and Sarah. You know, the Bible says that the man leaves his father and his mother in Genesis chapter uh, two. Uh, the man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two would become one flesh. So God is going to give this description about Sarah, but really it's the combination. It's the one flesh of Abraham and Sarah. And look at what he says here. Sarah was barren and she had no child. That's how God introduces Abraham and Sarah. Hey, this is Abraham and Sarah. They can't have children. They're barren. They're infertile. 
What an introduction. <laughs> How would you like it if I introduced you to somebody and I brought up your deficiency, your negativity, what you were lacking in? In a sense, we would look at this as a slight, as a, uh, a negative, but really God is complimenting Abraham. You see, what is it that drew God? What is it that attracted God to Abraham? There were millions of people on the earth that day in, the, in that time. What, what made God choose Abraham even above his brothers? Think about this for a second. Why did God move toward Abraham? What was it about Abraham that attracted God to him? You know, I was sharing this with our church on Sunday, and I want to share it with you. This is very important here, and I think it'll fit. Do you know that God does not like everybody? I can hear some of you just saying, oh, you know, I was with you, Rev. I was with you until, until you said that. Well, hold on for a second. I didn't say that God doesn't love everybody. God loves the whole world. We know that. But God is not necessarily fond of everybody, even if you're a Christian. Now, he loves you. But it doesn't necessarily mean he's fond or, you know, just really that necessarily, you know, into you. Now, why? You see, the Bible says about David that God and, and maybe we'll look at this next week. But the Bible says about David that God liked David. Now, I want you to think about this. David murdered people committed adultery, and the Bible says God liked him. The Bible says David had a heart after God, but he was imperfect. But there was qualities and there was something about David that God liked. And that's what we want to discover in this, uh, in, in this Bible study. You see, if God can like some people, if, God, if the Bible says God liked David, the implication or what God is inferring is that there are certain things in people, not in our spirits, but maybe in our paradigms that God doesn't like because it can hinder his favor and his love from flowing in your life. So what is it about Abraham that drew God to him? And the first description that God gives us, this is here for a reason. God is not putting this in the Bible because he had to meet, you know, publishers requirements. You know, he needed somebody to publish the Bible. And so he had to have a certain amount of chapters and verses in order to be able to get his book in Barnes and Noble. No, God published his own Bible. And when God put this in here, he's putting it in here for us to see. The first thing that happened with Abraham that drew God to him, the first description that God wants us to know about Abraham, listen to me close, he had weakness. He had weakness. Amen. He was barren. They were infertile. They had inadequacies. They had deficiency. You see, our deficiencies... And our weaknesses actually serve as the runway, the ground, the beachhead for God's power to flow in our life. I want to show you a quick truth from Genesis. Uh, I mean, not Genesis, Second Corinthians. And this 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 is something that I think will really help you. Second Corinthians chapter 15 and i want you to 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 look at something here and i want you to pay attention to this second corinthians chapter 12 excuse me not 15 second corinthians chapter 12 what was the first description that god gives about abraham his weakness he was un he was unable to produce children 
He had a deficiency. Now, your weakness may not be that you're infertile. Your weakness may not be uh, that your womb doesn't work. That's probably not your weakness. But you may have education. You may have weakness in your education. According to the world standard, maybe your color, maybe your gender, maybe your age. I don't know. Maybe it could be your credit if you're trying to get a home or something. It, everybody has weakness. What I want to show you tonight is instead of trying to be strong in yourself, that weakness that you have, that insufficiency, that inadequacy, is actually the beachhead, the, 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 the grounds that will attract the power of God. You see, we grew up thinking all our lives in the world be strong. So we point out our strengths. We don't let anybody see our weaknesses. We bring forth our strength. When you're putting an application, you put forth your strength. And I was telling you about my friend. He told, you know, he's sitting there with major league soccer executives in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue. And he tells them, I don't know any of this soccer stuff. What is he doing? Bringing out his weakness. Guess what they said? We don't care. We want you and we're going to pay you more than what you were making at your other job. What did he do? He, I'm going to show you a secret in dealing with God. Listen to me, my friend. God's way is higher than your way. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God does not operate like we operate. See, God tells us, tithe. Give 10% of your income. And if you do, you'll have more than if you kept 100%. What? That, that doesn't make sense. If I'm trying to get more, then I don't give away. But God says, give and it'll be given unto you. See, God's system is different from the world system. God told Jehoshaphat there were enemies coming against him. And God tells Jehoshaphat, he says, don't go out and get the, uh, you know, the Air Force. Don't go get the Navy. Don't go get the Marines. Don't call the army. Don't 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 do Don't bring any of the the, the soldiers in. He says, bring forth the singers. Go down to the first church of Israel and go and get the praise team from the church and have them come out and sing the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And he says, when they'll begin to sing, I'll give you the victory in the battle. Now, see, that's not what we would think. What we would think is grab the AK-47, get the, the, the armored trucks, get the best soldiers and go to war and let's, let's you know, beat the brakes off of them. Let's show them what we're made of, not to mess with Israel. But God's way is not our way. You see, when we praise God, why did God tell them to sing? Here's why. Because the Bible says that when we give God praise and we begin to sing, the Bible says that God inhabits or it draws God's power. It brings God on the scene. You see, God manifests himself in our weaknesses. And I want to show you this here. Look at what Paul said. This is a a revelation that he had, and I want you to get it tonight. Look at what he says in verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My unmerited favor, my, my goodness is sufficient for thee. Watch this. Listen close. For my strength. Now notice what he called. He, he switches grace out now for strength. So these are synonyms. So one way to understand the grace of God is one way to understand what it means to live under God's grace. Here, here's a definition according to God. To live under God's grace is to live by God's strength. See, you have a choice today. I'm presenting you a choice this Tuesday night. You can live by your strength. Check back with me 10 years or five years from now. Let me know how that works out for you. Or you can live by God's strength. 
How do you live by God's strength or how do you live by God's grace? That's what the grace of God is. It's living by the power of God. What do you want? Do you want to live by your power? Or do you want to live by God's power? If you want to live by God's power, how does it manifest? Look at this. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. See, we wouldn't think that. We would think, I need to be strong. You know, brother, God only helps those who help themselves. That's not true. You can't find that in the Bible. God never said that. Benjamin Franklin said that. God didn't say it. You see, even when we were kids, we learned. Think about that. What did we learn when we were children? I think it's physics. We learned that two positives actually repel each other. But a negative and a positive work. You see, don't bring your positives. Don't try to be strong in yourself. But in your negative, in your deficiency, in your inadequacies, that's when God's positive makes connection and makes things happen. And so look at what he says. Look at Paul's response. Once God tells him, hey, brother, Paul, settle down now. Don't worry. My strength, my grace works best in the areas where you're weak. So look at what Paul says now once God tells this truth to him. Therefore, will I rather glory, boast in my infirmity, my weakness, my deficiency. Why? Why am I boasting? Why am I now happy that, hey, you know what? I may not be the right color. Hey, you know what? I don't have the education. You know, you know, I never went. uh I never went to, to, to cemetery, I mean, seminary school. I never, ever went to any Bible college, none of these things. So in a sense, in the natural, that's a weakness. There are a lot of things. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I guarantee you that I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And I'm going to tell you something else. I'm not qualified to do anything that I'm doing right now. But in my weakness, I boast. I glory in them. Because where I'm weak, that's where I can see the power of God manifest in my life. I want you to think about something for a second. I want you to look at the areas in your life that you don't worry about. You don't think about them. You don't focus on them. If you'll take a step back and examine these areas of your life that you're not worried, anxious, that that you're not trying to put your strength on them and make it happen. I just want you to check. You tell me if I'm wrong. I may be. I doubt it. I guarantee you those areas in your life that you don't sweat, that's the areas in your life that you have the most ease and you see God's provision in that area. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. You see, subconsciously, you know this. In your spirit, you know this truth. And so look at what Paul says in verse 10. This is our last verse. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. Now watch this. For when I am weak, then, only then, am I strong. I want that to settle and rest in your heart this week. Boast in your weakness. Don't try to approach God in your strength. The areas in your life that you feel you're weak in. Like I said, it could be education. It could be credit reports. It could be uh, your age. 
Could be a lot of things. Maybe you're not qualified. Maybe you have things on your record. I don't know. Why don't you try this week taking those areas of weakness? Bring them before God. And say, Father, in this area of my life, maybe it's a sickness. Maybe you have a part in your body or something in your body that's not working right. Maybe it's financial. Maybe you're weak financially. Maybe you're weak in your influence. Why don't you bring that area to God and say, Father, this is an area that's weak in my life. Maybe it's parenting. Maybe it's how to be a husband. You know, my um, it's it's tough being a husband because women are different than men. And I need God to show me how to be a husband. These are the things that I, I do. I, you know, I only share with people the things that God has taught me. I don't know anything but what he's taught me. But if you'll take those areas where you're weak and just bring them to God. And be humble. Don't try to. Be strong. Now, am I telling you not to? Are we saying that God doesn't want you to be strong? No. God is going to make those areas of weakness strong. See, the Bible tells you to be strong, but be strong in the Lord. Let those areas of weakness uh, become strengths through the grace of God. So this week, I want to challenge you, even tonight, maybe before you go to bed or when you wake up in the morning. Just think of, ask God to show you an area that you're weak in, but maybe you're trying to be strong in your own ability and it's not working. Just go to God and bring that area of weakness and say, Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus for the grace of God in this area. Or you could say this, according to verse nine, I'm asking you for your strength in this area of my weakness. And just begin to be thankful and grateful that where you're weak, that's where you'll become strong. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for every person that was a part of this message tonight. And Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to cause the words that you spoke to be quickened in their heart. And show them how to apply this in their life. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it now, Father. And we thank you for the help of the Holy Spirit. Every area of weakness, we receive your grace to make us strong. In Jesus' name, amen.